Around the world, thousands of retired warships are rusting away, toxic nightmares filled with pollutants. What can be done with the aging relics? Cutting up and salvaging scrap metal from these ships is expensive and dangerous. Leaving them to rot, leaking fuel and harmful chemicals into the sea is a recipe for disaster. There is another option. Clean the ships really well, add some explosive charges, and sink them. Once on the ocean floor, former warships transform into vibrant artificial reefs. Marine species colonize these iron and steel structures at an astonishing pace. A Canadian team, the Artificial Reef Society of British Columbia, is attempting to sink its eighth project, the Annapolis, a 366-foot destroyer. But since their first tour of the decommissioned ship, the group has endured years of delays and regulatory hurdles. Thousands of volunteer hours have been invested in the project. Will it finally be sunk? In the Cayman Islands, the Kittiwake met a watery grave while hundreds of onlookers cheered. It's now a popular tourist attraction and a thriving man-made reef. In the Florida Keys, artificial reefs provide new marine habitat and relieve pressure on natural coral reefs. In May 2009, after more than a decade of delays and budget shortfalls, the USS Vandenberg was sunk in the waters off Key West. Sinking massive warships is not without its problems or opponents. Each project has to balance environmental concerns with ever-increasing costs and technical challenges. And sinkings don't always go as planned. The future is uncertain for these reefs of steel. From all this explosive energy and chaos comes life, marine life, as sunken ships transform into artificial reefs. Within days of sinking, algae begins to grow and invertebrates colonize iron and steel. Small fish gather, and soon apex predators appear, increasing diversity until a complex marine ecosystem is formed. In 2004, members of the Artificial Reef Society of British Columbia visited Canada's Pacific Naval Base on Vancouver Island. They were invited by government officials to inspect the Annapolis, a recently retired destroyer escort. The warship was for sale, but the team wasn't looking to buy it for scrap value or even to keep it afloat. They were planning to sink it as an artificial reef. Here we are down at the ex-HMCS Annapolis, um, just doing a walkthrough to sort of check on the general condition, which gives us an idea of what we've got to deal with for uh, um, preparation, cleaning, um, equipment removal, etc. Here we are in the wardroom. This is, uh, we use it as a lunchroom, but once it was the regal palace of, uh, of the uh, officers of the ship. Most of these ships were all built and they were uh, male only back in the, in the old days, and here we have female heads in wash place, so for obvious reasons, they have their own little space. These would have been all the ship's offices along this side. Um, you know, administration office, engineering office. This is engineers, paymaster's office down this way. 
West Roots business is marine salvage, and he knows boats, especially big Navy vessels. Actually, we'll go up the bridge first. Wes is the project manager for the Reef Society and has overseen the preparation, cleaning, and metal recycling on a half dozen of these Navy ships. And on the Annapolis, Wes is looking for treasure, metals that can be removed and sold to help fund the project. As far as the salvage value on the ship, of course, it's all recyclable metals. So any of the non-ferrous recyclable metals is where, is, is where any value is, the coppers, the brasses, the stainless steels. You just don't get any better than this. Lots of brass and copper, stainless aluminum. Um, this is what makes it all work. Here we are in the nice, shiny stainless steel galley. The price of stainless steel is pretty high right now, so it uh, definitely helps things. I was gonna get my wife a big soup pot like that because I've got six kids, but she didn't see the humor in it. <laughs> I look around at all the metal and effectively this is what fuels the whole machine. Uh, when we first started doing these ships, I had a nifty old guy helping me through this all. I still remember him going down to the engine room with one of the young guys that was working with us and he went down there and he says, Mike, he says, can you smell it? And he says, what Joe? He says, brass. He says, it's everywhere. <laughs> I haven't done so many of these ships of very similar design. Every time I get into one of these projects, I get on the ship and I go home at night and I wonder to myself, why do my legs hurt so much? And then I realize that I'm on the giant Stairmaster. There's more sets of stairs and all day long, you're going up and down stairs. If I've got a hard hat on, I'll knock the hat off a hundred times during the day. But once you work with the ship long enough, you just instinctively know it's like a cat with whiskers. You sort of move along and you can sense that it's there and just dip and rarely do I bang my head. Although salvage work is important to the project, West Root's main responsibility is preparing the ship for sinking. And that requires a zealous approach to removing pollutants, fuel, and other materials that just don't belong in the ocean. The ship's gonna have oil, especially in the machinery spaces. There's gonna be oil spilt on deck plates and underneath bits and pieces. And when we finish cleaning this ship, it'll be clean to the point, not only will you not see any oil, but when we flood the space, there will be no oil sheen on the water. And it takes a very small bit of oil to put a sheen on the water. To efficiently clean this ship, we probably need six months to do the job front to back, given all the little extra time you need for any problems that might arise. As much as it would be financially rewarding to cut this whole ship up into scrap steel, it's a fabulous end of these ships to send them as a reef. Um, we take enough salvage off to finance the job, but uh, this ship will be going for decades as, a, as an artificial reef, and it'll be a fabulous sight for both the fish and the divers. Hopefully the Annapolis will be given a real Viking's funeral as an artificial reef. If not, she'll have the ignoble fate of being towed to a scrapyard in the third world country and just cut into razor blades and the pollutants left on board the ship will end up back in the marine environment. It's a very big concern too from a pollution standpoint, uh, how well these ships are being prepared by people who are out in these uh, scrapyards, uh, simply tearing things apart uh, helter-skelter. Uh, we see that as uh, a total disregard for the real benefit use of an artificial reef, like a ship, in terms of usability and tourism. After lengthy negotiations, the Artificial Reef Society acquired this ship a few years after their initial inspection tour. But little did they know the Annapolis project would drag on for nearly a decade. The team was certainly the right one for the job. They had carefully prepared, salvaged, and sunk six of these ships and even a Boeing 737 aircraft. The first naval vessel acquired by the Artificial Reef Society was the HMCS Chaudière, a destroyer escort. The ship was built in Halifax in the 1950s at the height of the Cold War. After a long and distinguished career as a peacekeeper, it was purchased from the Canadian government for the princely sum of a dollar, plus tax, of course. No one could have ever imagined the Chaudière would serve out her final years on the ocean floor. Such a huge ship had never been purposely sunk in Canada. It was a daunting project, and the ship sinkers had to learn as they went along. When we first saw the Chaudière sitting at the dock in Esquimalt, I thought, this is nuts, this thing's huge. There's no way we're ever gonna turn this into an artificial reef. There's so much work to do. The sinking of the Chaudière didn't exactly go according to plan. 
These are large ships and we didn't have a lot of support vessels to help keep it in the right position. And when it started to sink, we had no more control over it. It actually got offline about 70 degrees and it also sank on its port side. Narrow ships are 366 feet long, but they're only 66 feet wide. So it's easy for them to get top heavy as they start to sink and then roll over. And that's what happened with the shot here. Neil's cameras mounted to the ship provided a fisheye view of the action. This is the Chaudière today. 20 years after being sunk, the ship is a magnificent artificial reef. It's lying on its port side on the bottom. It's a lovely wreck. It's more like a real shipwreck in that it's kind of haphazardly lying on the bottom rather than being upright the way the more recent ships have gone down. The Artificial Reef Society learned many hard lessons from their experiences with the Chaudière and later projects. They are now considered world leaders in this unusual field of expertise. Canadians have literally written the book on how to properly prepare, clean, and sink a ship within demanding environmental standards. Dr. Chris Harvey Clark is a biologist and professor at the University of British Columbia. He's an expert on marine life colonization of sunken ships. Today, along with veteran cinematographer and zoologist Neil McDaniel, Clark is making his first dives on two long-established reef projects, the wrecks of the Cape Breton and the Saskatchewan. What do you got in there, gold bars? Yeah, it's our, it's our beer cooler. Oh, good. <laughs> I'm glad, because it's heavy. That's a good sign. The shipwrecks are located a few miles offshore and are only accessible by boat. Okay. Charter operator Kevin Breckman makes a sizable chunk of his living shuttling scuba divers back and forth to the sites. The wrecks are a fantastic thing, specifically just for the biodiversity and for the increase in marine life. Uh, economically, they're spectacular because it increases not only the sport of diving and the interest in the sport of diving, but the offshoot of hotels, restaurants, just basically the tourist industry. It's just uh, a fantastic thing and hopefully we can continue to do so. The waters off British Columbia are generally dark and cold, but that doesn't stop most scuba divers in the province. They're a hardy bunch. Well, the water is darn cold here and uh, about 50 degrees Fahrenheit, so we've got to wear dry suits to protect ourselves thermally. Scuba divers here need a lot of equipment, heavy weight belts, buoyancy compensators, thick gloves and hoods. It can be a bit cumbersome. Uh, the moment of transition, when we go from being land animals to water animals. So Neil, I'm really pumped about this. I mean, this wreck's been here for 15 years. It should be absolutely loaded with marine life. So looking forward to the dive. Yeah, Chris, you're gonna like this dive. It's of all the uh, destroyer escorts that have been put down in BC, it's probably the, the richest in terms of marine life. And there's one more piece of heavy gear, the camera. Okay, you getting your workout today, Kevin? I am. There we go. You got her? Uh -huh. Okay. That is one heavy frickin' camera. It's good. Good thing you had your Wheaties this morning, Kevin. <laughs> totally. The big thing about sunken wrecks is that they're really a great big sampling device. They sit proud of the bottom, up in the water column where nothing was before. They're hard substrate and a lot of animals prefer to be attached to hard surfaces, particularly a lot of the invertebrates. There's a controversy about how animals and plants arrive on these wrecks, and particularly with fish, which can swim on and swim off. One school of thought has it that these things are giant sinkholes and all the animals in the area will come and cluster and it'll actually depopulate surrounding areas. There's another school of thought that these are actually amplifiers and a few fish will come and colonize and they'll reproduce and you'll get larger and larger numbers. I'm kind of favoring the second theory. These wrecks are havens. They actually provide a place for these animals to hide from predators, a place where they can lay their eggs, ability to get away from other animals that might be competitors, and of course things settle on the wrecks that they can feed on. So uh, they really, I think, uh, have an amplifying effect.
first thing you see is you're coming down the line and this ghostly white appearance coming at you out of the depths, out of the murk. And of course it's metridium, it's these giant white anemones that are everywhere carpeting the wreck and mostly white, there are a few other colors, but they're definitely one of the signatures of the Pacific Northwest and on, on these wrecks. And then of course lots of fish. And one of the signature fish we see are the rockfish family. These are these spiky looking, uh, long lived, quite territorial for the most part fish. And I think for me, one of the most exciting moments was seeing a species I hardly ever see anymore, the yellow eye rockfish, which is a long lived, lives to at least 128 years. After these wrecks sink, they stabilize, the invertebrates are attached, animals are starting to reproduce, fish populations are starting to grow, and that's what we're seeing now in the Nanaimo area. They have, I think, a golden period, and the golden period where they're just loaded with marine life happens in the decades, not in probably the first decade, but the second, third, fourth decade, it becomes loaded with marine life. These wrecks are just probably coming into their golden period now, 20 years on, and we're gonna see massive invertebrate life. The sponges are the thing that really strikes you. When you see a cloud sponge as big as a Chesterfield, that's an exciting thing to see. And all the animals that are then inside that and living in that, that's just a life layered on life. And that's the exciting thing about these wrecks because a lot of them have gone into places that are just a mud sand bottom, reasonably monotonous environment, uh, not a lot of structure, not a lot of hard substrate. and uh, now now we've, we've put these wrecks in and all these other things become possible. So what did you think of that? Beautiful. That was, that was fun. That was a great dive and a lot of diversity and a lot of density of life on that wreck. Everything we put in the ocean is a mixed bag and artificial reefs are probably on the plus side of that mixed bag. Are they absolutely benign? Probably not. Artificial reefs, if they're properly prepared and if they're sunk in the right place, can probably increase biodiversity and provide habitat that wasn't there before. It's not a new concept. People think that, you know, recreating the wheel here, it's not so. I mean, artificial reefs have been used for centuries to enhance marine life, especially fisheries and so on. Using these ships as a place for animals to grow and for divers to enjoy, I'm, I'm okay with that. I think it's a good thing. I mean, there is opposition, obviously, to these projects. A lot of these people, however, have never been on an artificial reef. They've never seen one. We have a very good track record here in BC as far as these projects go. I mean, we're, we're one of the world leaders in doing this kind of thing. A lot of places in the world, they look to BC, to what we've done here, for their inspiration and in doing these, these projects. You can't just take a vessel out there and you know, knock a few holes in it and send it to the bottom. I mean, that's not going to do. And I think nowadays uh, there's no public appetite for that. The government's not going to let it happen. And in many of these ships, when they're sunk, they're actually cleaner than, than the bottom of most of the hulls sitting in a marina. I think if it's done properly, uh, ship reefs are, are a great thing for the environment. Retired RCMP explosives expert Roy Gabriel has sunk more ships than most navies. Gabriel has overseen the demolition of a half dozen artificial reef society projects. Well, we've got to get this tank out of here. You see that or open it up and clean it out and that takes too long. Getting a vessel to the bottom quickly and upright is a technical challenge. It takes experience and lots of explosives. This is a sample of the uh, copper flex linear. It's designed and built specifically for cutting steel. It's RDX explosives on the inside with a, a copper sheeting around the outside. The shape of the charge controls the massive shock wave that's produced. The explosives create an intense narrow cone of energy that slices through an inch of steel plate in the blink of an eye. What we have here is the uh, face side or business side of the explosive charge. This is the portion that will face the inside of the ship and this is where the, it will actually physically cut a meter square hole or a 39 inch square hole out of the side of the ship. The explosion initially forces the steel outward. Water pressure pushes the plate back in and the ship floods. It usually takes weeks to plan and assemble the explosives that sink a big naval vessel. A dozen or more custom-designed panels blow meter-square holes in the ship. 
They're carried, sometimes down several levels to the bottom of the ship and fitted into place. Let me get one in the other side here. OK, that'll stay there, Bruce. Each of the charges is built to fit precisely against curved hulls. For the flex linear explosives to work effectively, they need to be an exact distance away from the steel. When the engine room, boiler room go off, to start with, these charges would jump right off the ship because there's so much shock wave and twisting going through the ship as it fires. All of this timber basically just gets, you know, blown into chipwood. Sinking an enormous warship requires that the explosive charges be precisely timed, fired in pairs inside the ship's hull just below the waterline. A tiny margin of error separates an upright artificial reef from a dangerous wreck sitting on her side, or in the worst case scenario, completely upside down. This is the former USS Spiegel Grove, an artificial reef in the Florida Keys. It's now a major scuba diving attraction, but it had a very troubled beginning. It's a good example of the potential risks and what can go horribly wrong when you sink thousands of tons of steel. After cleaning, the 510-foot, 5,400-ton ship was towed into position for final preparations. But on May 17, 2002, a day before she was supposed to sink, something went wrong. No one knows exactly why, but it began to sink prematurely. She was not only sinking, but she started to roll over and turned upside down. Air was trapped in the keel and the ship bobbed at the surface. The Spiegel Grove was now a shipping hazard. Getting the ship to the bottom and hopefully on her side was the first priority, and it needed to be done fast. Salvage teams were brought in, new holes were cut in the hull, and enormous balloons were used to help get the ship turned over. Once on the bottom and resting on her side, Hurricane Dennis intervened. The storm was serendipity indeed. Not only did it help push the ship over, it gently placed it upright, an event no one could have even remotely imagined. The Spiegel Grove is now a great example of what can go right with an artificial reef. It's a haven for marine life. Fish and encrusting invertebrates cover the ship. The wreck is a huge success, but critics of artificial reefs question how they affect the environment, fish populations, and natural reefs. The Spiegel Grove is part of a long-term study on the impact of artificial reefs. Lad Akins is the project manager of REEF, the Reef Environmental Education Foundation. The Spiegel Grove is in a very unique position. Uh, it's in a sand bottom area, away from the reef, but somewhat close, uh, let's say within a quarter mile of nearby natural reef areas. And I think the intent was to put it far enough away that even if it moved a little bit, it wouldn't damage the natural reef, but also close enough so that there could be interaction between the marine life on the natural reef system and on the wreck itself. And I think we're seeing a lot of that. We're in year four of a five-year study right now, looking at the fish assemblages, not only on the Spiegel Grove, but also on the adjacent natural reef areas. And we've really seen some great stuff. Uh, over 170 species of fish on the Spiegel Grove itself. There are a number of potential uses for these ships, one of which is placement as an artificial reef, but it has to be done properly. They have to be cleaned. There need to be studies done of what's in the area and what the potential impacts could be. And we really need to be careful about storm damage and deterioration of these structures through the years as well and think well in advance. Not just right now, what's it gonna do, but in 20 or 30 or 50 years, what's it gonna be doing? So I think when done properly, a ship placed as an artificial reef can be a very good thing.
That's not to say it always is, though. In Virginia, Texas, and California, hundreds of mothballed ships are part of the U.S. Defense Reserve Fleet. Some of the vessels are in good enough shape that they can be activated for duty in national emergencies. The oldest, most decrepit hulls are generally slated for recycling, but for many of the ships, their ultimate fate remains uncertain. Some are just too toxic with pollutants to scrap, while others are simply not valuable enough to bother scrapping. Even though it wasn't the largest in the Virginia Reserve Fleet, the USS Vandenberg was chosen for a unique project in Key West, Florida. The Vandenberg project was conceived back in, I guess, 1996. We had been put on notice as a community from the National Marine Sanctuary that they were going to allow us to put a large shipwreck down here in the sanctuary. And so we made a decision and we picked the Vandenberg out of an inventory of about 400 ships. We liked it because of all of the top side structure. We figured it would hold more fish that way. And it was listed as a low hazmat ship suitable for artificial reef. So we wanted a clean ship. It was cool looking, it was big. Those things kind of drove the decision. Several years into her retirement, the Vandenberg looked a little worse for wear. But she was destined to join several other successful artificial reef projects in the Florida Keys. The Vandenberg, from a historic perspective and recreational perspective, will complete the southern leg of the Florida Historic Shipwreck Trail. This one will be easily accessible for glass bottom boats and snorkelers, as well as scuba diving and fishing. So uh, it's something that everybody can participate in. Our reefs are struggling, as they are worldwide. And this project, we worked with the local maritime resource people and the National Marine Sanctuary to design a reef that would be attractive enough to physically move recreational pressure off of the natural reef and put it onto the artificial reef. Uh, it's designed specifically as a management tool for the sanctuary. As sink day approached, curious crowds gathered at the Key West Pier. It was a big event, unlike anything the community had ever experienced. It's not often that you sink a 500-foot ship on purpose. Right up until the last minute, there was still an enormous amount of work to do. To understand the work that's been done, to bring this ship fully compliant with a very strict and hundreds of pages of long best management practices from the EPA, the, the Marine Sanctuary, Florida Fish and Wildlife, Florida DEP, and there's about 18 different government, local, state, and federal agencies involved. It's very difficult, if you've never been through this, to understand the absolutely breathtaking amount of work that it takes to get this, this, this kind of project done. There's machinery, uh, hundreds of thousands of gallons of fuel, cleaning all the systems, pulling out vents and doors and a million feet of wire. We're working 12 and 14 hour days straight through to get her ready and, and have her properly prepared, fully compliant, ready to be deployed. For Key West, it means uh, we have a ship that's going to produce about six million dollars worth of revenue for the Monroe economy, about a half million dollars in sales taxes, and 191 new jobs in the middle of a recession, and that really uh, works well for us down here. It's always a bittersweet reunion for former sailors, but most servicemen agree that sinking a beloved ship and keeping it intact is preferable to it being cut up for scrap. I joined the Vandenberg in 1964. The ship was originally built as a mobile platform, so she was a mobile radar station. You couldn't put land-based radar stations every place in the world, but you could move the ship just about any place you wanted. The people on board did the data collection, and their job in doing that was to get as precise data as possible. We used to joke and say, we could track a basketball at a distance of 500 miles. The Vandenberg was important uh, because it contributed a lot of data on both American missiles and foreign missiles that was used throughout the Cold War in determining the balance of terror. Did we need more sophisticated missiles? Did we need bigger missiles? And by the same token, what were the Russians doing? What were they building? And how did they work? Uh, all that kind of information came from this ship. 
Uh, there's Russian wording above my head because this ship was a movie set for a movie called Virus, where it played the part of a Russian missile attacking ship. Okay, and it did a good job. I mean, they, it was a B movie, but they made money on it. It's a memorial plaque for a friend of ours that died a few years ago. That was a former instrumentation manager out here. Really good guy. And uh, hopefully his ashes will end up somewhere around here after it's sunk. It's nice to see the old rust bucket again. And uh, it's going to be very nice to see it sink out there and become something useful again. And I think turning it into a reef for fishing and for diving and things is a, is a positive outcome. As with all Navy ships, whether they're American, Canadian, or other nationality, military ceremonies are usually solemn affairs. Countless sailors lived and died on these once proud warriors. We had a memorial that honored my husband, Jack Steele, for his service on the Vandenberg, and it was touching. of observers made the trip to the sinking site. Boats were allowed to witness the historic event from a safe distance. There's a certain electricity in the air when a big ship sinks. A spectacle like this is unlike anything most people will ever see. preparation or how precisely the explosives are timed, there's always a nagging apprehension that the ship will roll over. It can be an extremely tense few minutes. The ship sank in less than two minutes, one minute 44 seconds to be exact. The demolition team did an outstanding job but even they had no idea the Vandenberg would sink so quickly. Awesome. It looked to me like it's supposed to look. I've seen a lot of these big ships sunk, and it really, it really looked like everything went the way it was supposed to go. The next day, dignitaries and participants headed out to the new dive site for a first look at the ship. a lot of current running this way. The wreck site is now one of the most visited scuba dives in the world. A tremendous success story. With the scuba diving crowd, the new artificial reef is a huge hit. Finally, we have the Florida Keys wreck trek completed. The sinking of the Vandenberg is absolutely phenomenal. We have wrecks starting in Key Largo all the way down to Key West that are world class. There's nowhere else in the world that divers will be able to experience what they're getting in the Florida Keys. Economically, it is great for the entire Keys. The pre-bookings for the summer, even into this winter, are off the chart. 
and I've dove all over the world. This is one of my better dives that I've ever had in my life. I'll continue coming back here, and it's a great opportunity for everybody also in, in the whole world to see what a beautiful artificial reef we've dropped down here. It's the best thing we've done in a long time. I think it's exactly what we planned it to be. I think it's the world's best wreck dive. That is fantastic. I think we, what do we have, 70 feet of visibility down there today, maybe 60. Real clear water, a little bit of current, and there's just a lot to see. It's just, it's just incredible. Everywhere you look, there's some other cool part of the wreck that sticks up at you. I think the Vandenberg will live up to all the promises that, that have been made. One of the Caribbean's most popular tourist and scuba diving destinations are the Cayman Islands. While a handful of shipwrecks here complement natural coral reefs, divers on the main island of Grand Cayman longed for a big new shipwreck of their own. Their prayers were answered with the long-awaited arrival of the USS Kitty Wake. We picked the Kitty Wake from a fleet of about 300 ships in that were in mothballs. We toured a lot of the ships. This ship was a great ship because it had a great history in the Caribbean already. It served some time in the Falkland Islands, recovered the black box of the Challenger explosion. So it had a good history. It's only gonna be 15 feet from the surface, so you're gonna have a lot of beautiful snorkeling adventures and then also diving adventures are gonna be endless dives. The day before the sinking, ex-sailors and tourists were allowed to visit the retired submarine rescue vessel. It had been nearly 30 years since former navigator John Gladstein set foot on the ship. When was the last time you did that, David? <laughs> been a while. Let's, uh, let's go back to the recompression chamber. All right, these are the recompression chambers. This had a hat. There's the hatch here and there, and they could decompress this side, leaving the inside uh, at full compression, and pass supplies in and out, and whatever they needed to do, people in and out, whatever they needed to do. Making an artificial reef out of thing like this, so rather than uh, reclaiming the steel, uh, uh, I don't know the science, but it seems obvious to me that it's better. This ship was always intended to serve divers, and this ship existed to serve divers, and it's great that she's going to continue to serve divers. For project manager Nancy Easterbrook, the Kitty Wake endeavor was a labor of love. It wasn't always a smooth process, but finally getting the ship to the bottom safely and upright would be a huge relief. Tomorrow we're finally going to sink her. I've been elated by this project, frustrated by it. I have been uh, overjoyed and all kinds of other things, but the only thing that's ever really scared me is to get her on her spot down in the ocean, upright, where she's supposed to go. But you know, we got good people doing this. All precautions have been taken, so I'm really very excited about tomorrow and cannot wait until we get her down in the bottom as the new diving attraction and snorkeling attraction for the Cayman Islands. The sinking of the Kitty Wake was a unique project. Unlike artificial reefs in Canada and Florida, the ship had to be sunk without the use of explosives. The Cayman Islands are one big marine park, and the sinking site was shallow and close to shore. The percussion of explosive charges can kill fish and other reef creatures in the vicinity of the sinking. So instead of using explosives, the ship had to be flooded manually. Strategically placed holes, both for flooding and for diver access, were cut along the side of the hull. Early on sink day, the hull of the Kitty Wake was flooded. Heavy pumps filled the ship with seawater as curious onlookers started to gather for the big event. Once the surrounding sea started to overflow the newly cut holes, the ship went down very quickly.
just minutes after sinking, a few divers were allowed underwater to take a look. The ship landed almost perfectly upright, a great relief to project organizers. Not surprisingly, small fish immediately moved on board, using the superstructure as shelter. And not long behind them, big predators like this barracuda ventured onto the ship. In a short period of time, the Kittiwake would become one of the top attractions in the Cayman Islands, both for fish and for tourists. This is the HMCS Annapolis. Workers are frantically preparing the ship for sinking. Howie Robbins first toured the Annapolis in 2004, scouting the ship as a potential reef project. When we first inspected the Annapolis back in 2004, we were thinking this was an extraordinary new opportunity, simply because the Annapolis was such a different ship compared to the other ships that we had already sunk. Fundamentally, the Annapolis has about 40% more exterior surface area, and that's due to the helicopter flight deck and hangar, and a few other features as well. Although it's the same length and width as our previous vessels, we believe the Annapolis offers a lot more habitat uh, space, which we think will be uh, beneficial for marine life. The Annapolis project has been fraught with problems, the first of which was the global financial meltdown of 2008. Scrap salvage is the main source of revenue for projects like these, and metal prices plummeted. Even with budget shortfalls and countless delays, the Annapolis project soldiers on with the help of hundreds of dedicated volunteers. Each weekend, they head out to the ship, cutting access holes, cleaning compartments, removing debris and scrap metal, whatever it takes. Our best estimate is we have over a thousand volunteers over a three and a half year period and an estimated 17,000 hours uh, put into the project. With just a week to go before a scheduled October 2012 sink date, the ship is still not quite ready. There's more cleaning required, oil and grease to be removed, and most of the diver access holes are not yet cut. Tons of scrap steel and other metals remain on board there's at least two more months of heavy labor to be done. Strict new environmental inspections may now delay the sinking well into 2013. Set to sink in a sheltered bay just a few miles from downtown Vancouver, the Annapolis project has also been plagued by protests and opposition. Many people feel that sinking a ship on purpose is akin to throwing a big tin can in the water. Garbage disposal on a grand scale. Every time you do something out in the marine environment, there are going to be people who are for it and people who are against it. And it doesn't really matter whether you're talking about aquaculture, about sinking a, a shipwreck. Is the sum total of what we're doing when we sink these ships, is it good or bad? I'm not an unbiased person where this is concerned. I think uh, for, from my viewpoint, uh, it's probably a better thing. It's a substrate, it's a place for animals to attach, and if we understand the wrecks can be a haven, then other places can be as well. Uh, we have high hopes for the Annapolis. I think she's going to be uh, well-traveled and well-visited, and also she's going into an area that's kind of mud sand bottom. Undoubtedly, she's going to become a magnet that will attract, retain, and amplify uh, marine life in the area. With more hard work and a bit of luck, the HMCS Annapolis will soon be resting on the seafloor. For now, like countless other warship relics, it awaits an uncertain fate. When it does sink, the Annapolis will serve its final mission as a reef of steel.